Now, please join me in welcoming Lieutenant General Bob Wood, Executive Vice President, AFSIA International, to the stage. Thank you. Thank you very much. I welcome all of you uh, to our first uh, panel session here in the new panel space set up. We are uh, following a great keynote address. If you had uh, the opportunity to hear General Carl speak about the Marines' approach to information, information warfare, and a variety of challenges, uh, you'll see that taking the next step in this panel as we talk about the MET-TC, the actual operational employment of uh, the variety of tools that we have available to defend cyberspace and to promote information operations, this will make great sense as we go through the panel. We are indeed happy to have this panel with us. They're all uh, experts in their own right, uh, well known to us at AFSIA, probably well known to you. Great, uh, great perspectives, uh, runs the gamut from uh, the uniform services through the agencies and industry. We are uh, very fortunate today to have as our panel moderator, uh, John Schleifer, our Vice President of Cyberspace Business Development at Bylight Professional IT Services. John's got good background experience in industry and in the military with a variety of missions that he's been part of. John is a retired Army Signal Colonel who's commanded brigade and battalion level signal forces in Iraq and Afghanistan. MET-TC means something to him, no doubt. Prior to transitioning to industry, he served as the commander of DISA's Joint Staff Support Center and was the J3 of Joint Task Force Global Network Ops, JTF GNO, during the stand-up of U.S. Cyber Command. A lot of experience, a lot of background, a little bit of scar tissue, but frankly some insights that I think will help him with the panel today uh, with a, a great uh, set of expertise to, sitting to his left. I'll allow him to introduce uh, the panel members. I'll allow the panel to proceed. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome our panel to the stage. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you all for attending. Um, I, I'll introduce the panelists. Uh, to the far left, uh, Brigadier General Brian Donahue. He's the Chief Operating Officer at Bylight Professional IT Services. And prior to joining Bylight, uh, Brian served 30 years in the Army uh, and with numerous assignments, including uh, uh, joint forces. Uh, he was, at, at one point, was the Chief of Staff at DISA, uh, also as the CENTCOM J6. Uh, Army G357 Land Hornet, uh, had Brigade Command, and uh, uh, also served in 82nd Airborne Division uh, as, as a commander there, too. Uh, next to him is uh, Lieutenant General, retired Michael Bosla. He's a senior vice president and client executive uh, for CACI. I did it right there, sir. International. Uh, General Bosla concluded his Air Force uh, career as the CIO for the Air Force, uh, official title Chief Information Dominance and Chief Information Officer. Uh, in that capacity, General Bosla was responsible for leading four directorates, supporting 77,000 cyber operations and support personnel across the globe. As a CIO, General Bosla has provided oversight of portfolio management that delivered enterprise architectures and mission support capabilities by networking air, space, and terrestrial assets. In addition, he is responsible for shaping doctrine, strategy, and policy for all cyberspace operations and support activities. And next to him, you'll find uh, Major General retired Jennifer Knapper. She's the Vice President at DXC Technology, serving clients in the United States uh, Department of Defense. Uh, Major General Napper retired from the Army after 30 years of distinguished service. Uh, her most recent assignments include uh, J5, uh, Director of Policy Plans and Partnerships for U.S. Cyber Command. And she was also the commander of uh, Army uh, NETCOM, Net Network Enterprise Technology Command. And she's also commanded the uh, 7th Theater Signal Command and uh, <laughs> numerous other commands, and I, I, I'll be up here reading bios all day, so I'm going to try to get to it so we can move out here. So uh, this isn't in his bio, but John Hickey is also a retired Army officer. Uh, he is currently DISA's cyber development executive, where he's responsible for delivering cyber capabilities to support the Department of Defense information networks. His portfolio includes 
mobility, network operations, cybersecurity, and innovation. Uh, prior to uh, this role, Mr. Hickey served as a DISA Cybersecurity Risk Management Executive and CIO, where he was responsible, was responsible for managing risk in cyber domain and ensuring security within DISA and across Department of Defense Information Networks. And the final panelist, <coughs> Colonel Paul Kraft, is the Director of Operations, the J3, for Joint Force Headquarters, Department of Defense Information Networks. JFHQ Doden. He's responsible for operational level command and control of Doden network operations and defensive cyber operations for all DOD networks, their functional synchronization and integration as a key subordinate organization of U.S. Cyber Command. So prior to coming to JFHQ Doden, Colonel Kraft was the brigade commander for DISA's Global Operations Command at Scott Air Force Base in Illinois and he has uh, previously commanded the 86th Expeditionary Signal Battalion at headquartered out of Fort Huachuca and deployed it uh, as part of the 2010-2011 surge into Afghanistan as a Signal Task Force Commander for Army Communications Units in Southern and Western Afghanistan, and also as the J-6 uh, U.S. Forces Afghanistan South. So as you see, we, we have a fairly illustrious panel here. And, and as I look out in the audience, I was going to say, you know, how many military do we have, but I don't see a whole lot of uniforms. But I know that a number of you have served, and uh, I, I uh, would understand that if you come to AFSIA that a number of you are in, interested in defense contracting. So the subject today is train like you fight using MET-TC in defensive cyberspace operations training. So what does MET-TC mean? Anybody out there want to take a gander at it besides Tim Groton? Uh, no. The acronym METTC stands for Mission, Enemy, Terrain, and Weather, Troops and Capabilities, Time, and Civil Considerations. These words reflect military significant factors in an operational environment. They provide a time-tested prism to view the composite of conditions, circumstances, and influences that affect decisions about the employment of forces and capabilities. In a traditional battlefield, MET-TC considerations provide military professionals an estimate of the situation. As such, they serve as a baseline for deliberate and crisis action planning. Military staffs often evaluate METTC as preconditions for execution. Most operations and states are expressed in terms of METTC to describe desired effects and operational successes. In short, METTC focuses military professionals on what is important in the battle space, but as that saying goes, what was then, that was then, and this is now. In 2011, cyberspace was declared an operational domain by the Secretary of Defense. As the domain continues to evolve, to evolve it will soon be the global responsibility of a functional combatant commander. U.S. Cyber Command. Does METS-TC appropriately capture the military significant factors of cyberspace domain that bear on decision making? After all, cyberspace possesses different operational characteristics from the air, land, maritime, and space domains. It's a man-made domain that can be created, modified, destroyed, and even recreated. There are multiple layers of the domain, physical, logical, and cyber persona layers. Areas of operations are ill-defined. Boundaries are subject to either physical, geographic, nor national state borders. The speed of execution, net speed, in cyberspace approaches that of light speed. Operational reach, is almost instant and global. Cyberspace also impacts all joint functions. 
it cuts across all other operational domains, and it is an integral part of society. So do these unique factors through MedTC, uh, correction, so do, do these unique aspects of the cyberspace domain change what we evaluate as military, militarily significant factors through MedTC? Are these operational characteristics so unique that they change what goes into a commander's estimate of the situation? For these answers and a more in-depth look at how MedTC is applied to study the operational environment, the, the panel is going to take that one on today. So starting to my left, and hopefully it is on, and uh, you, you need to understand I worked for a couple of the people that are up here on the panel, so they sort of got to decide how this is going to work. So don't think that we're just going to start all the way down on the left and work our way to the right, uh, because once you work for someone, you, you always work for them. So with that said, uh, the first volunteer to go forward with his uh, remarks is uh, Brigadier General Brian Donahue. Okay, many of you out there may not be familiar with the uh, term METC. Uh, those of you who are familiar with it uh, may have a hard time getting your head around how is it relevant to cyberspace operations. Um, I think what's missing here is some key context. Uh, this is not shoving a round peg into a square hole. Uh, there's some strategic context I would suggest that's missing uh, that will make the linkage for you of why METC is in fact relevant uh, to be applied to the newest of the operational domains of cyberspace. Unfortunately, to, to uh, give you that context, I've got to rewind the clock a little bit for you. Let me take you back to 2010. Uh, in 2010, Chairman had already declared cyberspace an operational domain. Uh, U.S. Cyber Command had uh, reached FOC in November of 2010, and U.S. Cyber Command had four subordinate commands at that time and four service cyber components. The concept plan at that time for the uh, Unified Command Plan mission to conduct full spectrum cyberspace operations uh, was a, owned by U.S. Strategic Command. Uh, the concept plan broke the mission area or the mission up into three pieces or three mission areas. The first one was to defend the nation against strategic attack. The second one was secure, operate, and defend the DODU. The third one was combat and command support. Uh, commander at the time was General Alexander. Um, he made a decision in 2010 to defer the secure, operate, and defend mission area. His comment was, he knows it's not right, at least there's something there. Let's focus in on what's new. Uh, what's new was the Cyber Mission Force. Now, the Cyber Mission Force wasn't finally approved until 2013, but the initial focus of U.S. Cyber Command was on the two mission areas of defend the nation against strategic attack an OCO support to a combat command. Understand in this context actually explains a lot of things in cyberspace. Um, the first four years of cyber command's existence, it was focused on command and control of the cyber mission forces. Um, every combatant commander who's assigned a mission to the unified command plan has to do a commander's estimate every year and submit it to the JCS and ultimately to the Secretary of Defense. In 2011, while U.S. Cyber Command was focused on uh, defending nation, I'll refer to it as DTN, and OCO support to command commands, uh, Commander U.S. Stratcom submitted his commander's estimate on his mission to conduct full spectrum cyberspace operations. Uh, it was the commander's assessment that for this, the C2 framework, command and control framework, for the secure operate and defend mission area was inefficient and ineffective. He state, clearly stated what he needed was unity of command and effort for all DOD components that conduct DOTA operations and defense to include those not GIF-MIG assigned uh, to Commander U.S. DRACOM. Those not familiar with GIF-MIG, that is the process of which forces are assigned or allocated to combatant commanders. Uh, once this commander's estimate uh, hit the building, it generated a JCS XOR in June of 2013. It said you can no longer defer this missionary. You need to develop it. 
Well, to solve this problem, uh, there were five conditions that had to be met. First of all, and all these three of the first, the three of these first five conditions were uh, approved by the Secretary of Defense on 13 November 13, and ultimately published in a JCSX order the following day. First three conditions were you needed to establish a command that was aligned to the Secure Operating Defense Mission Area. The second was you need to identify the commander of this organization. The third was that you had to empower this organization to achieve unity of command and effort over all DOD components that conduct DOD and OPS and DCU-IDM. SECTEF's decisions were to stand up Joint Force Headquarters DODEN. Uh, it is an operational level headquarters. It has a span of control of 42 DOD components, nine combatant commands, and nine U.S. Cyber Command forward elements called integrated planning elements, formerly known as Joint Force Headquarters Forward, formerly known as Doden Commands. The director of DISA was designated to be the commander of Joint Force Headquarters Doden. It was per JCSX order explicitly restricted that no dual hatting beneath uh, the director of DISA. Uh, DISA is actually a subordinate organization to Joint Force Headquarters Doden. Of those 42 AO commands, it's nine combatant commands, four service cyber components, and 28 uh, se separate agencies. Now those agencies run all the way from the IC community to those that have a preponderance or a significant um, Doden Ops and DCU IDEA mission like MDA, DLA, and others. Uh, but it also includes uh, the Defense Commissary Agency, uh, Defense Security Services, and those that don't even have 24 by 7 op centers, but yet we're going to integrate them into the C2 framework. The third piece was to em empower the commander and the command, the operational level command. The problem was is that all the existing C2 frameworks, com COCOM, operational control, tactical control, general support, and direct support, uh, d would not work because all of those command relationships are based on the core mission of the organization that you have command authority over. So also approved by the SECDEF and ultimately in this November 14X order was a term referred to as DACO, a Directive Authority for Cyberspace Operations. The key here was how do you achieve unity of command and effort for DOTAN operations and defense without assuming the core mission of the organization that you have authority over? Uh, Joint Force Headquarters Doden wanted no authority or responsibility, for example, of the Defense Commissary Agency or the Defense Intelligence Agency. But to achieve unity of command and effort, there needed to be a, a C2 authority created uh, to achieve and solve the problem of Commander U.S. Stratcom. That's where DACO, or Direct Authority for Cyberspace Operations, came from. Uh, the uh, fourth condition that had to be met was uh, to integrate uh, the deferred mission area in with the other two mission areas that was done through a series of JCS, U.S. Stratcom, and U.S. Cyber Command exports. The fifth and final point or condition that had to be met was the issuance, the development and issuance of an operational level order. That order is referred to as Operation Gladiator Shield. Now this order will achieve the same thing that every operational level commander assigned a mission in any other operational domain must do. He must organize his battle space in terms of terrain and forces. He must determine his priorities of operations, both for, in our case, in the case of Joint Force Headquarters Doden, uh, for Doden Ops and DCU IDM. <coughs> and finally, it must do an aggregate risk assessment. So what do these five conditions really mean to uh, the community, to the Department of Defense and the perspective and why METTC is, is operationally relevant. What it represents is a transition from an administrative uh, framework largely created by Klinger Cohen in 1986, which generated the service and agency enterprise networks. So it's a move from an, opera, uh, an administrative framework to an operational domain declared back in 2010 where only combatant commands have authorities to conduct military operations in, mil in operational domains. So it's a transition from an administrative, a, a largely administrative framework 
run by the CIO community created by Klinger Cohen, to an operational command framework to conduct military operations under the authority of an operational commander, a combatant commander, <clears throat> and that includes risk. So we are no longer tied, or this is a transition from uh, that administrative mindset to literally an operational commander and an operational framework where operational risk will be assumed by the operational commander. So METTC is, is, def is clearly relevant uh, in the establishment of uh, the organization of this battle space under the proper authorities. Uh, hopefully that context is uh, relevant not just for the METTC discussion, uh, but also it's relevant to a lot of other things that otherwise would not make sense or unexplainable in cyberspace. I'll pause there and uh, pass to Colonel Kraft at this point to give you an operational perspective as the J3. Uh, my opinion, this colonel is the most of deserving colonel on active duty to be on the next 07 list, uh, but hopefully that will manifest itself in a year from now. Thank you, sir, for that introduction. And uh, thanks to AFCIA for uh, setting up this great panel. Uh, quickly, for a Met -TC, from the METTC perspective, just like General Donahue said, um, we're now looking at it very much from an operational framework, uh, not an administrative framework. And with that, uh, breaking down METTC, if I could just pick a couple to key on, a couple uh, pictures. I think the biggest one for me as uh, the Director of Operations is terrain. Cyber terrain, ever-changing, man-made, joint, global, uh, is, is very tough to define, especially because it is, it is ever-changing. So just from a, a global perspective, just at the boundary, um, as far as break and fix, we're breaking, fixing, well, we're fixing, not breaking. About every four minutes, there's a network change. About every three minutes, there's a defensive change. So the speed at which this network is being built, constructed, de destruct, uh, destructed, uh, extended, projected, and pulled back is at, is at net speed. Okay, so you, we have to understand that. And there is no, um, we can't say there's a land area that we just have to defend because it ends up having to be, having to be defended globally. So the concepts of terrain in this environment are radically different than the concepts of terrain in land, air, and sea. That's, that's probably my number one. Uh, number two is, from the METTC perspective, is time. The time at which we have to respond to the enemy threats is gauged in seconds and minutes, not in, not in minutes, hours, days. And, and our ability to constitute or reconstitute our forces in order to operate, secure, and actively defend this network must happen at net speed. We talk about it, it's kind of a buzzword, but uh, we're doing this in, in all practicality today at the speed at which we have to operate because we don't get another chance if there's a wanna cry or wanna crypt out there if we don't have our defenses or security set, uh, set in place. Um, and the last one I'll hit on um, is is a civil consideration. So the one things we have to do is make sure we're operating in the, in the context of the law within US code. Uh, and that's our Title 10. Uh, we talked about Title 40 and 44 authorities from a CIO perspective on that build, operate, maintain, secure, defend perspective. All those have to work um, contiguously, um, and I'll say, and simultaneously to make sure we're doing things. We can't have defenders doing one thing and making a block while the operators don't know that that is happening or why they just lost services. Um, or the, the maintainers can't try to change the network which causes an outage the operators don't know about. So everyone has to work together, I'll say globally, in order for this really to operate effectively. And that, that's something that the commander has to look at from their operational environment to make that determination in terms of what has to happen in an instance to, so they understand what they're responsible for within their terrain who their troops are that they have to execute that operation from a secure operate uh, defend perspective and then the speed at which it has to happen. And a, the, one of the big things that has to be done within Operation Gladiator Shield that uh, General Donahue mentioned um, is the development of not just understanding your mission essential tasks but then being able to break those down into mission relevant cyber terrain. What is the, what is the piece of terrain that you have to absolutely keep running and defended or you, or you lose your organization's ability to do its job, okay? That has to be deconstructed by every operational commander so they understand what has to truly be defended. It may be an application, 
it may be a data center, it may be a critical link that's leaving your headquarters. All of which are keys, uh, keys to your success that you have to think differently in this uh, domain known as cyber. Thank you. You're next, Mr. Hayes. So, so I think Paul hit it. Ob obviously, Joint Force Headquarters Doden is the defend part of the entire Doden. And from a DISA perspective, I'll represent the build part. How do we build the capabilities that are required for the, the three highlighted areas, the key terrain, the time and speed at which we have to operate, and, and, and then the other piece, the civilian uh, consequences, laws, rules that limit sometimes our ability to go offensive, so we're pretty much in a defensive role. So I, I would say, um, from a build standpoint, it, it's definitely relevant. What's the mission? The mission is to build capability, defend the Doden from a DISA perspective, uh, and, and defend our country even more importantly. I, I, I would say the other one I'll highlight is the enemy. Know your enemy. The enemy is, is vast. It, it's in very different locations, has very different objectives, and probably in cyberspace is much more diverse than anything we've ever seen before. And I, I would also add on to that, you cannot defend everything. Again, these are lessons that we have learned over many, many years of grabbing terrain and trying to defend terrain with people. You take the same principle within this domain and it's just not feasible. So capability is key. Understanding the enemy and what they're doing and how we can adapt to that from a civilian standpoint having industry as our partner who develops many of the tools and the internet that we ride on today, how do we integrate those capabilities together? Because that's truly the part that still isn't there. There's many solutions and they all do a piece of the defense, but they don't integrate in a seamless way. And then I'll, I'll leave you with humans can't do all of this. They are the key ingredient. You have to have artificial intelligence, mis machine learning, you have to re-baseline. You have to look at things like software-defined networks and the ability to move, just like you would move on the battle space, the network's got to move. And then the last thing I would say, and I think all of us should take this as the key point, you got to get the anatomy out of the network. You have to know who's on your network. You have to have a strong identity tied to that. And I, I think all of us are frustrated of our identities being out on the internet, the things about us out on the internet, we need a digital identity that identifies you and is secure because that will allow us to fight on this network, whether it's the internet or the SIPRNet, our own secure network, you've got to start with that basic principle. Well, good afternoon. Um, thanks again for coming down to hear just a little bit about some of the things that keep us thinking and, and up at night. Uh, for those of y'all that don't know me, I'm a Texas Aggie, so I can only focus at one thing at a time and then, then move on to the next target. So um, we've gone from the strategic to the operational. I'm going to take you down into the tactical area just a little bit. You know, as uh, Brian mentioned, 10 years ago, we started defining cyberspace operations as operations to be conducted in and through cyberspace for some military objective or national objective. Um, and that definition is continuing to evolve as it should. But it's the only man-made domain in the sense that there's actual hardware, software, and electrons flowing. And so I like to look at the terrain and look at it and see how many of our current military kinds of definitions of terrain and uses of terrain and of exploitations of terrain could be applied in this area. And so when I look at it, I think about the see yourself first and understanding the baseline, something that both Paul and, and John mentioned. Uh, that patch and maintain piece is not something you have to do in other domains. We don't have to patch our air domain for my air brother here. Um, there's some agility that you have in this area, and, and I think Paul mentioned it well about the speed of operations and being able to be agile. You can't be agile on the, I would argue, on the, um, and maybe someone will push back on me in a minute, but I don't think you can be agile on the kludged together legacy networks in the hundreds that we have today for which these fine gentlemen are responsible for operating and defending. I don't think we can be agile there. 
I think we ought to think about terms like active defense and what does that mean? And I'm sure some lawyers will come up and tell me afterwards all the reasons why we have to be careful of what that means to our civilian counterparts. Can we put obstacles? Can we do deception? What about battle damage assessments? We don't even use those kinds of language. We're beginning to say what's the operational impact, which is a start, but it's not quite the same. And then back to the topic, how do you train for DCO TAP? And I say you do task and standards that continually modify the conditions. The only other time I can think of where we said defense is going to have its own specialty and its own branch and do its own thing was when we said we would do air defense for the ground forces with its own branch. So what could we learn from what they had to go through? What kind of deconfliction in the air domain and cyberspace domain applies? Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to my newest service brother here. And because you, you know, in the last 70 years have had to figure out all this for two other domains, and maybe we could take some lessons from that. Well, well thanks, Jennifer, and, uh, and also thanks to FC, and thanks to you folks uh, for joining us today. Get the feedback taken care of. John, thanks for pulling this together. The cyber attack, my <laughs> colleague says. Interesting that, um, um, I guess I didn't realize this when John invited me to participate here, that uh, I would be the only airman on the panel, and that uh, the rest of my panel members are, are Army uh, retinue. Cool. cool. I tried, sir, but I couldn't get uh, any of those other services to show up, so. <laughs> can, we, can we kill that, hum? Which one of us is pointed incorrectly? Huh? That's Move it. Closer to my mic. No, no, it was, All right, I'll move closer to the mic. How's that, Jeff? Ben, is that good? So anyway, so um, I'm the only uh, airman up here, and um, I kind of took this uh, task a little bit different than the others, but, but I also want to say everything they said is inform me about METTC. Uh, we don't necessarily talk about that in the air domain, but I think what I'll share with you will build on that and show how we think about it uh, in, in the same kind of manner, but using different terms. The task here was train as you fight, train like you fight. Well, I took this task and I said, where the heck are, where is our Air Force today? Where is our cyber element of that Air Force? And where are we going? I think that we're doing a pretty good job when we talk about train as we fight of the airmen we're bringing into the Air Force. We've established an aptitude test that says, hey, this airman has a cyber kind of mindset, and we're willing to send that airman to the training that's required. This is a, a little bit of hum in the back, or am I wrong? No, it's all right. Okay. Anyway, so we got an aptitude test. We've got our courses, our initial training courses, down at Keesler Air Force Base. We've developed them. They were in response to the uh, challenge that uh, we received from the SecDef and the commander of U.S. Cyber Command that Brian talked about. We've got the follow-on courses uh, that, that uh, the Navy is sponsoring at Pensacola Air Station right now um, uh, for developing those certifications required by, for our joint warfighters. So I think that training is in place. The area that I think that, you know, in my Air Force that we need to focus on the most for our cyber operators to train as, as like we fight is operationalizing the cyber airmen operationalize that and they will in turn be cyber airmen for our Air Force mission requirements and for our joint mission requirements. So that's kind of what I want to talk about a little bit today. I, before I retired, I developed our first cyber flight plan. I'm, I can't control that. It's another cyber attack. Maybe they don't want to hear the airmen talk. I don't know. Probably it. So um, I developed our first uh, cyber flight plan, signed by the Chief of Staff of the Air Force, since updated by the, uh, the general that took my place. So we've got a new cyber uh, flight plan out there. Operationalizing our cyber airmen and our cyber workforce. In my mind, I had to look at what are the missions of the Air Force. And there are five missions, and they've been around as long as the Air Force has. They are air and space superiority, Intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. Rapid global mobility. Global
transmission areas are to create effects. And, the, and in terms of the Air Force capabilities we want to create, they are global vigilance, global reach, and global power. Now, how the heck does that tie to cyberspace? Well, I believe that it ties directly because every one of these mission areas and every one of these capabilities Um, empire builder here, but truly every one of our airmen need to be cyber warriors for the specialties at which they are assigned. Let me give you an example. Our first, um, our first capability of global vigil vigilance, that is the ISR domain. Um, uh, cyber is all about what we, uh, cyber, through, through cyber, excuse me, we sense the data that is used by our decision makers. We acquired a new platform, a weapon system F-35. It is the greatest sensor that the Air Force has today. We are now fielding a new trainer for our pilots. It is my contention that our pilots have to be taught from the moment they get into that TX trainer what their requirements are as a cyber operator because they are going to be part of that ecosystem. The same is true when we field a new tanker, when we field a new, um, uh, a new missile. So I, I, it was part of our flight plan to have cyber operators integrated in each of those operational squadrons. And by the way, they need to be integrated in the business system squadrons as well. Now, so that's developing a cadre for mission assurance. We are having a debate in the Air Force right now whether a mission assurance in a missile squadron should be a missile, uh, missile maintenance or a missile operator or should be a cyber operator. I think that, the, um, uh, that we're going to have an amalgamation of both. We are also going to have pure cyber operators, and those cyber operators will probably be doing the um, uh, proactive defensive cyber operations and offensive cyber operations. So we're going to have a cadre of those folks as well. I think the Air Force, with regard to global vigilance, has, has taken a step recently, or about to take a step that they're going to announce, that they are going to combine our AFT Cyber, 24th Air Force, and our ISR numbered Air Force, 25th Air Force, and they're going to combine that to make a new numbered Air Force and move it under Air Combat Command, our force provider. So organization, too, is important how we train uh, our cyber warriors. The other thing that um, uh, is critically important is that we exercise and conduct our war games with cyber operators fully integrated. We recently took a great step at Red Flag out at Nellis Air Force Base when Red Flag was commanded by a space officer and the Air Operations Center was commanded by a cyber officer. That is an air-heavy, air-centric uh, war game, if you will, but space and cyber were fully integrated because of the recognition that in order to accomplish today's mission, you got to have cyber in part of the fight. Um, I think that... Uh, you know, I've got, a, I've got a lot of things here, but um, I, I don't want to steal away the time for our, um, for our questions and answers. I will say that um, uh, with regard to um, global reach, that's a unique challenge for our cyber operators. Global reach in the air business is about uh, air mobility command, and air mobility command is conducted in an unclassified environment because of their mission partners. So that adds another dimension of cyber challenge to the cyber warriors that need to be integrated into those mobility missions. Um, we, I heard mention doctrine. Um, we need to know what red doctrine is, and we need to have blue forces that are operating uh, in accordance with the red doctrine that they're going to be facing. Um, space, we heard space mention. Space is an extension of the cyber domain. I want our cyber warriors to be able to protect our space assets and to be able to um, uh, create that air uh, superiority that those space assets represent. The 
last thing I'll tell you, I think that it's important from an industry perspective, where do you get involved? Well, as we heard from uh, uh, John, I believe, say a moment ago, you're part of the fight today. Industry is part of the fight. So you are the, either delivering capabilities or you are sitting next to uh, the um, active duty, guard, reserve, and civil servants who are providing the capabilities. I know in the 50th Space Wing, they have put out a request for contractors to help defend the Air Force Space Control Network. You will be sitting next to that, uh, that operator. You will be one of those operators. So this, again, reinforces my point that you're going to be fully integrated in the mission, and you're going to have to understand uh, what the cyber elements are in order to guarantee that mission occurs. The final thing that I would say, a key part of our training of the future is live, virtual, and constructed environments. Um, uh, we did, I showed you the example of the uh, red flag out at Nellis Air Force Base, but much of the work that's going to be conducted in this area will be virtually uh, conducted and constructed environments as we've already heard. So I think there's a big play and role for, for industry in the future. Thanks very much. I look forward to your questions. Hey, hey ma'am, while you're waiting uh, I'll, and you get that work, uh, I'll ask a couple of uh, teaser questions to get the, uh, the, the panel moving here. Oh, go, go ahead, sir. Uh, being the setup guy up front, uh, being the setup guy up front, um, let me circle back on, on a few things. Uh, first of all, I, I'm not a big believer in the, uh, the, the man-made domain aspect. It is is a huge military uh, dimension of this problem set of this challenge. Uh, the air domain and the space domain, uh, space existed at the time of Sun Tzu and Napoleon. It wasn't until such time as that operational domain was militarized that it became operationally relevant to war fighting functions. If you look at uh, cyberspace, why is cyberspace now operationally relevant? Uh, initially, we leveraged the, uh, the capacities and capabilities of Doden as former Deputy Secretary of Defense Lynn said in less than a generation, we leveraged the Doden and IT technologies to give us an operational advantage over any adversary. You look at military operations today and what every one of these booths behind us represents is that the it is the capacities and capabilities that the, the Doden enables the, not just the war fighting function, but all four core functions of DOD. The, the IC functions, the serviceman train equip, as well as the business functions. It is those dependencies uh, and those that contribute directly or tie directly to the mission assurance of not just combatant commands, but every DOD component is why it's necessary to provide secure and accurately defend those. Uh, the second piece I would highlight is that the uh, DCO challenge. Um, because it is a man-made domain, there is an aspect here that impacts uh, D uh, DCO. Uh, there's two unique aspects to it. First of all, if you're gonna ask somebody to defend terrain in cyberspace, they must be familiar with that terrain. What OGAS, or Operation Gladiator Shield, is gonna to try to do, Joint Press Headquarters Doden is gonna break a lot of rice bolts. Because in, in, a, in a, achieving unity of command and effort in these areas of operations, that spans all the way from the enterprise level, through programs of record, platform IT, all the way down to ICS GATA, down at the base post campus station level. One operational commander directing operation, one operational framework, I should say, directing operations, one operational chain of command or operational framework that is assuming operational risk. The scope of uh, the secure operating defend mission area. Um, I don't want to get into numbers here. To, to, to everything we're saying here, we're trying to parse through the classification filter here. Uh, but once the third mission area, secure operating defend, became came into scope for cyberspace operations, it more than exponentially increased the number of, of cyberspace forces. What we are talking about here is no more independent operations of cybersecurity service providers, no more independent uh, PMs and P, uh, programs of record assuming risk independent of the operational commander. Uh, what the intent here is to achieve unity of command and effort over any DOD entity that conducts Doden Ops and DCO IDM across the whole of the Doden 
and that's going to be through an operational command structure. That buys enough time to get to the questions. <laughs> Are you working, ma'am? I believe I am. Thank okay. you. Can I ask one to begin with? Just Absolutely. To, be okay. my guest. So uh, one of the challenges that we've noticed is uh, the incredible amount of money that is being spent to train cyber mission forces. Uh, one estimate I saw for the Army Cyber Protection Brigade was somewhere in the nature of $14 million being spent in, in, in a year uh, in order to train his personnel. So anything from certified ethical hacker to CISSP to Security Plus, you, you, you name it, uh, all of the training that occurs. And so they're, they're continually uh, chasing certifications, but uh, quite often what we find is when those folks show up to come to work on the mission, uh, they're not necessarily prepared or certified to work on that network. So what, what sort of uh, mission-specific uh, techniques could be used to, uh, to help improve the cyber operational proficiency uh, of, of the operators? <laughs> All right, so I just want to say up, up front that um, we, the DoD, have some of the best soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, civilians, and contractors working for us right now. Um, they are, they are well-trained, they continue to be trained. So I want to say that up front, uh, these, these, guys, these guys, these girls are awesome. Um, one of the challenges though we have is with the train constantly changing, regardless of the you know, certifications that you, you roll in with, you have to still learn that terrain. In, in the land domain, that's a map. And that map generally doesn't change. The mountains are on the left. There's a road in the middle. You know, say there's a lake over here. But in the cyber domain, that terrain is constantly changing. And so a solution to that challenge of bringing on well-trained individuals who, who are, have certifications is to be able to orient them quickly to that terrain that they find themselves to actively defend. And a way to do that is through a persistent cyber training environment. Um, some of that persistent cyber training environment uh, General Bosler uh, talked about, um, it, live virtual constructed training. There are cyber training ranges uh, all over, all, I'll say all over the place um, that we're tying into, but a key part of that is if we've got to push out cyber protection teams, for example, um, a, a, a capability that would help us to do that is the means to quickly uh, construct a picture of the network they're, they're about to go to. So a, a quick network mapping capability that, will, that can be, then be sent to a, a training range that can be applied to, this, to that cyber training range for that organization, whether it's in its preparation phases, can go through and see what that train is. So when they land or when they get to that organization, whether it's uh, close access or remote, they know exactly what they're looking for and they can apply those certifications and the training that they do have on that tr new terrain that they're involved with today. So that's kind of a, a cure for the problem that we face today from my perspective. Thank you. Let me, uh, let me tie into Paul real quickly. Is uh, So we have a DOD cyber range that, that's part of uh, my portfolio within DISA, but it's also a joint range run and operated by the Marine Corps. So think of joint training, the ability to virtualize. As Paul described, uh, some of our perimeter, our regional capability, and then tie that into a scenario-based training. And, and again, understand who you're training. Are you training network operators? Or are you training analysts? And again, these are areas that we are doing today. Uh, as Paul says, that costs more money. You have to have that environment. But think of a persistent training environment where I can take a copy of what we did during CyberFlag and I can just make that instance available and tie it into a scenario and I can make that remotely available via the internet to the cyber protection teams. We're doing that today. Obviously, that's pretty expensive to maintain over time, but if you don't do that, what you will have as you change the network, you change the capability, you'll have untrained uh, people running the network. And I, I, I want to highlight this domain, unlike other domains, has a very heavy civilian influence from a contractor standpoint defending the Doden. And, and we need to understand that. We just can't train the military. We have to train the DOD civilians and the contractors 
that are out there on the edge of the network making the changes so they understand what what is happening we also need to train them on what the enemy patterns are and so we developed a thing called NASCAR in partnership with NSA and in partnership with DOD CIO what is the threat we're defending against how is that threat moving across the network so and, and NASCAR stands for nipper sipper cybersecurity architectural review but it's more than that it's a framework and model that describes the threat we have today our tools and capability and obviously it's classified, but we share that and we educate the workforce, military, civilian, and contractor on what those requirements are and what that enemy is doing and what our capabilities are. So I'd like to take it from a little bit different approach, John. I'll get with you later. I don't want to steal our time. Yeah, just a real quick, um, I know why we started the certification path and, and we were looking you know, back in the day, it's not today about compliance and at least having a baseline that we can understand what skill levels people were bringing to the table. But have we outgrown it? Is it time to look differently at how we're, and I know there's a whole industry <coughs> built around getting everybody certified and keeping them certified, but have we outgrown that? Is it time to look, you know, with the basic skill set that you guys are teaching and you mentioned at Keesler Air Force Base and other places, and then get them on those ranges where you can adjust and show the changes dynamically? What do you think? I, I, I agree. I, I think Paul's lived this in <laughs> both his hats, so go ahead. No, no so ma'am, I see, I'll, I'll, I'll totally agree. I, I think the challenge we have right now is being able to build a like today, is to build a like kind network for what that cyber protection team, whoever the case is, is going to go in to defend. Um, to quickly map it and then replicate it in a training environment is the challenge. We have some environments that are replicated, others, many that are not. And so that capability in order to do that quickly is I think a key to our success. Yeah, and I wanna add that, um, I'll tell you, many Air Force uh, leaders are coming to me and say, uh, we have so darn many tools on that network right now that it is really impossible to keep our warriors trained on all those, uh, on all those tools. And some of that, now I, I got a suit on right now and I represent uh, defense industry. Some of that is that, uh, that we are trying to sell our products to government. Now, it's, on, it's their responsibility in order to sift through that, and it's a very difficult challenge. Sift through that, right, and in my mind, simplify the network to the level possible. Now, that, that, that's an oxymoron, because if you simplify it too much, you might make it easier on the enemy than a complex network. But we have to get it to the right standard. I think the word chosen over there was absolutely right. And I think our current initiatives in the, um, in the joint world to develop that standard architecture under JTF, uh, JF Joint Force Headquarters Doden and DISA is absolutely the right way to go. Yeah, if I could comment on this um, and try to normalize things a little bit here uh, and get out of the cyber realm to make an analogy. Uh, in all other operational domains, before you conduct military operations, there are two prerequisite or fundamental steps that have to occur. You have to do intelligence prep of the battlefield. You have to understand the threat and adversary capability and you need to do joint situational development so you understand the terrain, the, the aspects of associated with the execution of that, uh, that mission. Cyberspace is an operational domain. Many of the norms in other, in other operational domains apply directly to cyberspace operations and hence met, met TC characterization. But we do need to understand that the nuances that make this different. One is that in all of their operational domains, Services, man, train, equip, and certify formations are prepared to be employed by combatant commands to conduct military operations. In cyberspace, cyberspace forces do not return to services. They get employed and they must be trained and reconstituted while employed. What we're talking about here through breaking these rice bowls with Operation Gladiator Shield, the cyberspace forces we're talking about are largely civilian contractor and military. So this has to be done virtually. It has to be something that, that's agile to keep up with the ever evolving adversary. But at its core, it's no different than any other operational domain. Before you send somebody on a mission, you have to have do the IPB or intelligence prep at battlefield, and you have to do the joint situational development if you expect anybody to be successful in the operation. Thank you. 
I would like to remind everyone, if you do have questions, please mail them to askmemilcom. That's all one word, askmemilcom at gmail.com. The first question for the panel is, how will Cybercom's new acquisition authorities help in building better operational capabilities? Are the services working together to identify requirements for the cyber operational forces? I'll take, I'll take that. Um, I'm parsing what I, what I can say and should say and can't say here. Um, there is a recognition by the department that uh, the Secure Operating Defend mission area is continuous operations and sustained conflict. It, is no, it fits every doctrinal definition of an active campaign just like in Iraq and Afghanistan. It just happens to be in a new domain called cyberspace. Um, given that, uh, there's, when there are active campaigns, the acquisition process has changed. As many of you know, in Iraq and Afghanistan, joint urgent operational need statements and operational need statements that tried to meet the department's requirements inside the FIDEP's five-year term and get it inside a two-year term. Uh, that is a part of the discussion with the U.S. Cyber Command, with the uh, staffers on the Hill on what acquisition authorities need to be changed uh, to allow U.S. Cyber Command uh, to, in fact, prosecute an active ongoing campaign within the Secure Operating and Defend Mission Area. Uh, the other aspect of this is there's some discussions about FBF 11 type money like SOCOM has. Um, that's not exact a square peg for a square hole. That, uh, there's a little bit of nuances that are unique just to SOCOM, uh, but there is uh, discussion uh, between U.S. Cyber Command and uh, staffers in the, uh, as it relates to the NDAA to recognize that cyberspace is just continuous operations and sustained conflict and a FIDEP base five-year turn on acquisition and procurement uh, needs to recognize that requirement. I think that's all I'll say before I get hey, in trouble. Now. I think I summarized it well. And uh, I'd, I'd point out that U.S. Cyber Command is having their first uh, actual acquisition industry day on the 27th on Friday. So I think uh, we'll, we'll find out more about what their, uh, their path forward is going to be with that. But, but, you know, I mean, there's another pr very practical <coughs> element to this, and that is getting at uh, Paul's comment about the speed of need. And, uh, and this will speed the process, I, I believe. And secondly, um, uh, it will, I think, better enable acquiring joint capabilities, which the joint warfighter will need. Yes, sir. And it is a primary objective of Commander U.S. Cyber Command is to try to chase the holy grail that JFCOM chased for a decade, try yeah. to get more things joint. Right. Thank you. I thought the Army had responsibility for the joint persistent cyber training environment. Is that still true? And will this be a federated set of training ranges or something different? Let me, let me take that one. So the Army is the executive agent, but the other services and DISA are partnered with them. And again, they're, they're, they're fleshing out how to tie uh, that together as they move forward from an acquisition standpoint. But yes, they are the executive agent for the persistent training environment. But again, there's a lot of support uh, for the different, different ranges that are out there. And obviously, U.S. Cyber Command is driving those requirements from a joint perspective. Thank you. How are we preparing junior to senior leadership to see the cyberspace domain? Are we using MET-TC? Uh, I can tell you that, that uh, I've been the senior advisor up at Joint Force Headquarters for the last four and a half years. Uh, the biggest problem we have is uh, with experience, especially in the senior leaders. Uh, most senior leader decision mechanism forms are based are built around the fact that that senior leader has 20 30 40 years of experience from which to draw from even those you see like a former uh, I, won't, I don't want to give specifics here because you might figure out what i'm talking about but <laughs> even those that have been in cyber command before uh in the past they are now coming back to cyber command what they knew was the truth five six years ago or even just two three years ago is no longer the truth. The pace of change in cyberspace, because it's a new and maturing operational domain, 
is a significant impediment. Uh, Colonel Kraft has been helping uh, the new deputy commander with uh, uh, some onboarding type of uh, sessions. And um, he keeps asking a question of why can't a uh, e uh, E5 sergeant answer these questions for me? Why do I need the J3 of Joint Force Headquarters Doden? And the answer is, is Paul's uniquely qualified to be the J3 of Joint Force Headquarters Doden. There are very few people that have the skills, experience that Paul's uh, fortunate enough to have uh, so uh, it's going to be a while. It's just going to take time to build the experience base, both at the uh, junior enlisted, uh, the Department of Army civilians, and it, also at the senior leader level uh, to get past the experience. Many of y'all have probably heard General Hernandez talk of, uh, and still continues to lead the charge in this area of the professional development of the Army officers to understand cyber and how to utilize operations in and through cyberspace and integrate them into all their other operations. And so in the Army, the Cyber Institute up at West Point works really hard on those kinds of hard discussion points and, and does that for the Chief of Staff of the Army and brings that back into the TRADOC fold. I think you have a different um, outline and, and process in the Air Force for that. Yeah, yeah and, and uh, great, thank you, Jennifer. Yeah, I was gonna mention this, that, um, um, so I see this question really having two parts. Um, so internal to the Air Force, we have a senior leader course at uh, Maxwell Air Force Base that will bring our operators down and give them, you know, uh, probably one week of, of cyber operations, so fairly limited. But, um, but these operators are gonna be the JTF commanders for the air components uh, and have to make decisions. I've had JTF commanders tell me I would like some cyber capabilities in my quiver so I could have non-kinetic options. And so, so I see it. I see we have to educate those folks, but, but taking, you know, what this panel says, I mean, they're not gonna learn that in a week and they're not gonna, and their experience today won't necessarily be relevant in, in two years. So they need these junior folks around them who bring other capabilities and skill sets, not necessarily the art of war in their quiver, but bring the capabilities associated with the cyber domain that they can marry with these senior leaders' wartime experience. And I think that, that marriage has to occur, and it's a different model whereby uh, in the past you always wanted those senior group around you. Maybe now you're gonna have a few more junior folks in that, in that fold. Well, and, and I just wanna highlight what, what the challenge is gonna be is retention, uh, especially with some of the junior folks that are looking to go to mid-level, mid both in the officer and NCO ranks. Uh, many of you in the audience uh, go and recruit those those young people and, and it's a little bit different because this is a really nice fit with the civilian sector where driving a tank maybe is not something that uh, they're going to do on the outside. Maybe they can drive a truck. Uh, so it's going to be a challenge and you're going to have to give incentives. We've done this in other areas. I come from the Army where they pulled officers aside, made them network engineers and automation folks. Now there's cyber folks, I'm one of those folks, but at some point you, you gotta understand you're only gonna keep them so long. Yeah. If I could comment on that, and it gets back to my uh, setup and context earlier. Um, because cyberspace for the first four years was focused in on to defend the nation against strategic attack and OCO supports command commands, and just on the cyber mission force, uh, many segregated mentally and physically uh, Dota and Ops and, and CND or information assurance. Um, Doden operations and DCUIDM is no fundamental, is no, there is no difference between NetOps and CND. Uh, the, the network providers are part of cyberspace operations. Or, what is new is the offensive side of it. What is new is transitioning from an administrative uh, framework to an operational command structure. What's new is the dependency that Every, the mission assurance of virtually every DOD component, not just combatant commanders, has become dependent upon the DOD. And so the criticality in being able to provide, secure, and actively defend those DOD dependencies in support of the mission assurance of that combatant commander or defense commissary agency director is an operational imperative. Do you have a comment? Uh, just, just quickly, because I've been asked this a couple times about training and, and retention. And, and I'll say, Given a choice, as a, as a former commander, now director of operations, I will always choose to train the people 
and, um, and retain them uh, versus not train them and, and retain them, okay? So I'm always gonna push for more training for my personnel, um, looking at the great patriots that we do have. There's so many things within the Department of Defense that our cyber operators uh, on the defense and offense do that you just necessarily don't get in industry. And that's the reason why many, many of them stay on board because of the things they're able to do for our nation today. Thank you. Thank you. What is the impact of the area of operations construct on defense of the network? I'll take that one, Steve. Um, cyberspace is an operational domain. Uh, the first thing any operational commander in any operational domain does when he's assigned a mission is he organizes his forces in his battle space. Uh, what the AO concept does is it treats the Doden as a joint operations area and it, deli and it assigns 100% over, it's gonna take us, uh, us, I'm sorry, it's gonna take Joint Force Headquarters Doden a year plus to fully organize the, the Doden, but the, the objective is that an, a commander or director has command responsibility and authority to achieve unity of command or effort over his assigned AO in the aggregate of those 42 areas of operations equals the totality of the dope. So Brian, does that mean it's the area of interest for all the other COCOMs and all the other joint commanders? No. So uh, area of interest so they understand what's going on? No, the, the c c command commands actually have assigned areas of operation. You, you have nine command commands, two different types. You have three functional command commands and um, six geographic command commands. The geographic command commands actually have an assigned area of operations within within a Doden, and that is command command constructed networks. Uh, that is things like uh, the Centrix networks, the Centcom partner networks, anything that the command command actually uh, creates. Um, that the reality I call it the Klinger Cohen effect is Klinger Cohen created service and agency enterprise networks that have developed a a. Um, norm that they operate largely autonomously. Uh, they either try to meet whatever Doden Office requirements ha are within the, the capacity that they have control over, or th they defend within those capacities. What Joint Force Headquarters Doden represents is the ability to fight the Doden as a unified joint force. That every AO commander has an assigned area of responsibility, but just like in Iraq and Afghanistan, this is no different than the regional commands in, in Afghanistan. The IJC in Afghanistan is the operational level headquarters. Now those not familiar with the, I use that term operational, I should explain it, is that you, there's three levels of warfare, strategic, operational, and tactical. So the operational level headquarters, it is uh, Joint Force Headquarters Doden's job is to direct tactical execution to either meet or support strategic objectives, not only defined by US STRATCOM, but our US Cyber Command, but also any other command command or any other uh, entity that's uh, responsible for a DOD core function. The area of interest um, is hard to pin on because area of interest is largely anything outside of the DOD. The area of influence is, is a gray area that there's, um, uh, Paul very familiar with, there are some gray battle space meaning um, technically commercially owned uh, that are directly relevant to operations and defense of the Doden. Thank you. In your opinions, can we really expect civilians on the Doden to use METTC to secure DOD networks? Not unto itself. It's just a fundamental principle from which to build from. The more, the more norms that we can build, uh, steal that are time tested from other operational domains, that have applicability in cyberspace, it does two things for us. I mean, if you look back at the land war fighting domain, for example, um, in, the, in the maturation of it, uh, it started where infantry fought autonomous from the armor force and from the field artillery forces. And it was only over time that, that the land warfare domain realized the synergistic effects of combining those into what the Marine Corps would call a Marine Air Ground Task Force today or combined arms report uh, approach for the, for the Army. And so th that same maturation will occur in cyberspace, or needs to occur in cyberspace. And, and, so, and if I could, ahead. so, you know, I'll say after a couple years of training, and as many as the, 
esteemed panel members, but Met, Met T was something that I picked up in the 80s. And then it became Met TC in the early 90s. And then we had a new thing called Pemisi P, <coughs> which was mid 2000s. And then we had a thing called IPB, Intel Prep of the Battlefield, which was mid late 2000s. And then we have a new thing called JIPO, Joint Intel Prep of the Operational Environment. All these constructs and concepts are frameworks by which to look at and see the problem and the current situation. So my expectation is over the next course of the couple of years that uh, some smart person is going to come out with a framework and a way to look at the cyber domain um, that will be very similar to how we look at many of these concepts here are land domain terms. It's Thank probably going to be you. Yeah. Yeah. Let, let me add, though, uh, being a DOD civilian, uh, my folks understand mission. They understand vision. They understand the components of what makes up Met TC. And I also tell them to go read The Art of War think about these things if they're in the DOD. So I, I, I wouldn't underestimate, and I just gave a speech on this for Cyber uh, Month to some of the youngest people I have in the organization, and they were excited. They had never even heard of the art of war, didn't know what it was, and these are geeks. These are computer science folks. So challenge them. I told them the book was small, it was free online, and they got excited about it, and they gave me feedback. So I, I, I think we can always learn, and, and I, I think they, they are, the, the, they're great Americans, civilians, contractors, everybody that are in DOD for a reason, so. As Sun Tzu said, he who defends everything defends nothing. Uh, the same is true in its cyberspace domain. Can you elaborate on the joint cyber training exercise where we're building our I'm sorry, we're, we're building our ability to jointly fight in this domain. What in particular needs to be added or changed to these exercises to build the joint cyber team? I'll, I'll jump on that one. So, so there, are multiple, there are multiple cyber ranges, therefore multiple cyber um, um, exercises that are going on throughout the year. The, the construct or the concept called the persistent cyber training environment is one that's gonna be this overarching umbrella, the focus, the focal point of all that training, in, um, the training environment. Um, but it's gonna give an opportunity for combatant commands, services, and agencies to be able to go and use, uh, link into a virtually constructed network. Uh, the goal would be that it's much like their own network, their own, their own production network that they have, so that they can see how to best defend, they can see where their maybe where their holes are. They can see uh, terrain their terrain better, and they can you know fix and break it and not do anything to it except the next day we can turn it back on and try it again. Um, we can put um, cyber protection teams in there. We can put red teams in there, and we can fight on the we can fight on that constructed virtual terrain um, on behalf of in, and in support of the organizations that want to use the training environment. So if that answers the question. And, and I'll just add to it from the build standpoint, we've been held back a little bit because it's expensive to build that out and make it persistent, right? Uh, some commercial technologies are helping in that space for sure. But again, it was an area that wasn't funded for the pure volume of people that want to use the persistent training environment and the dynamic nature at which it needs to change to keep up with the network and emulate the entire network and also as Paul highlighted, the adversary, the red team piece of this is important. Those are short supply assets, right? I used to have a red team that worked for me. Everybody wants a red team. And then the hunt team, or, or in, as Paul refers to, the cyber protection teams, those, those are key elements. Same in industry today, trying to find those people, keep them, train them, and, and uh, again, limited supply of those type of expertise but they're the ones that really make it real. That's that human element of what the adversary is doing. So I, I think it's a resource piece, and it's also it's, it's how you train those forces and keep those forces in a demand signal that's very high for we need a red team for almost every exercise we're going to run today. And, and you know, the, um, uh, with regard to these limited resources, uh, the Air Force has a couple of uh, guard and reserve squadrons uh, up in Maryland. Uh, in uh, Seattle, Washington, uh, to name a couple of them. And uh, these folks are in industry in some of the, uh, the largest, uh, uh, most technically advanced cyber uh, companies in our nation. 
and uh, they're putting their uniforms on uh, every month on a weekend and a few weeks a month, a year, uh, to do exactly what these guys are talking about. Participate in those exercises, serve with the red team, and uh, also train the blue forces. Yeah, if I could just try to continuously be a common theme here, is the more we can recognize the similarities with other operational domains, the faster cyberspace will mature. The training requirement for cyberspace and operational domain is, is no different fundamentally than other operational domains. You have individual training requirements, you have collective training requirements, and you have multi-echelon training requirements. Every one of those is critical. Every one of them has a different solution set. What is, what you now, we now need to realize that there is a, a, a technology aspect to this. For example, if you have on the build side, as Mr. Hick is responsible for, uh, let's pick a program like uh, Joint Regional Security Stack. You now have the services in DISA doing a build function. The capabilities of that, how it will be employed, who will be responsible for what uh, functions and activities associated with the operations of that new technology is a decision that needs to be made by the operational commander who's going to ultimately employ that technology. Not the PM, not the guys on the build side, but rather the operational commander. So what's going to be new here is that when you have a major modernization effort such as Joint Regional Security Stack or JRSS, the build function will take it to a point. There needs to be a significant transition window where Paul Kraft and others on the operational side understand the capabilities of it, understand how to optimize those, determine what subordinate AO commander or director is best postured to execute a specific task on that, operationalize that capability, assume the risk, and then issue an, ex an order that then codifies how that new technology will actually be employed in a sustained conflict and continue, or correct, sustained operations and continuous conflict. This is an ongoing fight. This is modernization and training to, again, sustain operations and continuous conflict. Let me, let me pile on to something that uh, the team is saying up here and Brian just uh, emphasized. And that is um, uh, we're, we, the Air Force, is, is leaning on and leveraging uh, the 70 years of the air domain in order to educate the cyber warriors of today. That means adopting similar language, adopting similar processes, see how the cyber capabilities can fit into the Air Operations Center in the air testing order um, a development process. Now speed is going to be different, but the terminology is going to be very similar, uh, and, the, and that helps that capability, those warriors, become part of that team and integrate into the air, space, and cyberspace domains. Thank you. Are the training standards and certifications for cyber consistent across the services? Well, uh, U.S. Cyber yes. Command, when they elevate to a functional command, command, uh, they're good. they take on some core functions. One is a joint force provider, and also uh, in that context, uh, U.S. Cyber Command will try to normalize uh, joint training or training to a joint standard because of the, the, the cyber intermixed and the absolute imperative for interoperability. Yeah, so uh, they put out all that information about the cyber mission force. They went ahead and published basic standards for each of the teams and the, the color teams within the cyber mission force. And that came out of the J7 of the U.S. Cyber Command through STRATCOM since it was not elevated yet, but it still came out as a standard by which if you serve as Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine, want to present your forces, they have to be trained in the standard. So yes, there's a joint standard. Let me give you some operational examples of why that's an imperative. Uh, right now, today, uh, uh, September 16, uh, U.S. Cyber Command XOR delegated DACO authority to each service cyber component so they could actually establish a service area of operation all the way from whatever enterprise activity that service does, again, through PIT, POR, all the way down to ICS, SCADA. And they have DACO authority over every service DOD component that conducts node and operations and defense. Okay, play this out in your mind. You now have an Army area of operations where you have Commander R. Cyber who has responsibility for all DOD and ops and DCU IDM within that area of operations to achieve unity of effort. 
he has an entity that's under his authority called the Army Research Lab. The Army Research Lab provides CSSB support for over 30 uh, other DOD components. Some of those DOD components are Army. Many of them are not. So visualize this. You have an area of operations that's the Army's AO, but yet there's an Army entity in there that's providing CSSP support into the Navy, or the Fleet Cyber, rather, area of operations. What does that mean operationally? Now you have Commander R. Cyber that's not only responsible for, the, for his area of operations as a supporter commander, he is now a support team commander to Fleet Cyber because one of his entities is providing CSSP support to that area of operations. That will fall apart immediately if there's not a consistency in what we would refer to as joint TTP, joint operations, joint standards, joint execution. Anyone else? We have time for one final question. What is the status of the JIE? Is it still a goal? Mr. Hickey? Everybody's <laughs> looking at me. Since, <laughs> since I sit on the GIE XCOM and on behalf of this. Is, so, so yes, I, I'd say we're using it today. We're using it and in, in, in spreading that. Uh, General Bosler talked about ISR, uh, airborne ISR. Uh, there, there, there's an element underneath there. Cybersecurity. Uh, he also talked about the number of tools. I, I agree with him. Tools are converging between DCO operations and network operations. We run a, a very large network, obviously, at DISA. So uh, how, do we, how do we look at that and leverage the tools? Um, so perimeter defenses falls within my portfolio. How do we look at the perimeter defenses, look at the regional defenses, look at the endpoint, and then look at a big data lake concept that can tie into the BDP, big data platforms that the services has. Definitely, you, you would not in industry build a network with four different services doing all different things. So you have to have that joint architecture that ties these pieces together, because if you go back earlier, you gotta integrate the defenses and you gotta provide the information. That's truly the key to winning the war. The information, the defenses have to be integrated and you gotta put that at the appropriate level. So whether operational, strategic, or tactical, they can fight the battle. And then we have to tie it into our, our, our mobile uh, capability and our tactical capability that's on the floor today that you guys are, are displaying. It, it's, it's, it's not going to work in, if you don't do that. So, yes, that, that group is active. Uh, I, I, I go every month to the Pentagon, and I have various people underneath me that work the architectural, the cybersecurity, the airborne pieces uh, fall under Jesse Showers and the network. We support the DOD CIO, and we do that in conjunction with the services and other agencies that are a part of that construct. As the, as the uh, person who actually created JAE, the concept and sold it to the department, let me give you a different perspective. Uh, the objective end state for JAE was to, in essence, do the exact yep. same thing to the department that e-service did with uh, Klinger Cohen, and that's create a joint uh, DOD-wide enterprise framework. Uh, the impediment to moving forward there is somebody making the, the decision and directing services and agencies to give up their service and agency enterprise networks and move to JAA end state. And it's literally no different than what each service and agency did by collapsing the hundreds and thousands of networks, pre gold or nickels, um, a correction, Klinger Cohen, uh, and doing it at the department level. Uh, but we've really, uh, the department has really hit an impasse until such time as somebody makes a decision uh, to direct the services to go to and agencies, all to go joint, so you can achieve JAN state, which is a joint, single joint um, enterprise framework for the Department of Defense. So I'm going to foot stomp that. It needs to be directed. Uh, it was, it was, uh, there was a, a memorandum signed by the DOD CIO. It needs to come from, the, and the uh, Deputy Secretary of Defense at one time, but it needs to be directed by the Secretary of Defense, and the services need to give up their TOA in support of this joint capability. And that's when we're going to have uh, the true GA. Doing great things right now under a coalition of the willing, and I think there's an appreciation for what it means to have that joint capability but it needs to be mandatory and the funds need to be transferred to DISA. 
I, I just want to make sure that you get the right quote on who said that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think he wrote an article for uh, Signal Magazine a while back uh, with yeah, a similar I, I, theme. I, I can't get in trouble with this one, but let, let me just run with this a little bit further. Um, <laughs> we are moving from an administrative framework that was led by CIOs whose purpose in life was to realize economies, efficiencies, and the federal government's ability to provide itself IT services or office automation. 51% vote on any decision made by a CIO is based on economies, efficiencies. You are, we are now moving the DODEN from an administrative framework to an operational command structure. For anybody who served any time with a combatant commander or an operational commander, 51% vote goes to effectiveness. And look at, well, now we need to start thinking through things, like everybody wants to move to the cloud because there's economies of efficiencies to be realized. But if you're an operational commander, you realize I just created a single point of failure in my cloud access point that could be exploited by an adversary. Am I willing to accept that risk based on the economies of efficiencies that we gain by moving to the cloud? So my purpose for bringing all this up is not to say right or wrong, but rather to say that dynamics in the calculus has changed. When you have operational commanders making operational risk assessments, the economy's efficiencies are no longer going to get 51% of the vote. My opinion. Ladies and gentlemen, or lady and gentlemen, uh, thank you so much for your participation on the panel. It's uh, uh, truly appreciated, and uh, if we could get a big round of applause for the panelists.